I see we all have the uh, the books in the background as per. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's 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 yeah. that's that's that's, that's phone uh, at this point. So. <laughs> yeah, I I think um, well, you know, I have a built in. We have an office in my house, and my wife and I were like, you know, should we try to go to the basement and like hire a carpenter and actually get like a full wall of books because we Whoa. we like reading. But we also kind of stop buying books because where are you gonna put them, right? Yeah. So that yeah, makes sense. Uh, but we're really interested in building like an Islamic library, but one where there's English translations of the things. Except we're really, really particular on scholars. So mm. um, you know, uh, less influence from the Saudi region, more on the four matab. You know, so it's always like Fair very enough. particular on like who translated this and you know what's the agenda, and that's kind of how right. we always find our books. Yeah, free. That makes sense. Well, it was very confusing when I converted back in 2006, and I was literally just given tons of free books, and like they caught so many books would contradict themselves, and I was like, what is going on? Oh, really? On? Oh, man. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> No. Everyone loves giving the new convert a bunch of books. Yeah. <laughs> Little did they know he was going to read them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you definitely bucked the trend on that, to be honest. <laughs> I think anyone that makes it this far in the nonprofit field, kind of, we're all a little geeky. So. Yeah, uh, fair enough. <laughs> all right, guys. I think, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start um, and then we're going to get some support to make sure that we're live on Facebook, but we're recording and we're live mm -hmm. through the, the link uh, that we, you know, that you guys had in uh, the original uh, uh, invitation. So everything's square and we'll, and this will be, if anything, if it's not live on Facebook now, it'll be up in like, like five minutes after we're done. Okay. All right. All right. So I'm just going to start now. Salam alaikum, everybody. And thank you to all for joining us. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined for this important conversation by Robert McCaw, the Government Affairs Director at Care National, and Yusuf Shahoud, an Assistant Professor in Political Science at Christopher Newport University. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, and, so, and so the, the, the context for this discussion is it's something really important uh, in the immediate aftermath of the 2020 election, exit poll surveys released by Care National and AP Votecast offered some surprising revelations. Uh, between 18 to 35% of Muslims in America cast a vote for President Trump. So these results prove something that a lot of American Muslims already knew, which is that our community is not a monolith. It turns out individuals are complex and different. So a whole group of them functions quite similarly. However, while this statement uh, makes sense to people at an abstract level, uh, many are unable to grapple with the complexity that this entails. Uh, if a group is not a monolith, then it's very likely one whose members make different voter choices, have different political interests, different worldviews, and so on. In this sense, then the finding should not be surprising, but this one just seems a little different. And it feels like the reason should be obvious given the stark differences that appear between both parties. But these findings are consistent with something perhaps more politically significant. This year, Trump maintained a lead on Biden in donations from working and middle class uh, people and those without a college education, while his vote shares rose among minority ethnic communities across the board, save for in certain metropolitan areas in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia. In those states, Democrats can thank get out the vote organizations like Fair Fight, Black Voters Matter Fund, and others for carrying them to the finish line. Meanwhile, when compared to 2016, the Democrats experienced their most significant vote total increases in affluent majority white suburbs. So their, their donation leads can be almost entirely attributed to the urban and suburban regions of four coastal states, California, New York, Massachusetts, Washington. So the age old political truism, right, is that elections are won at the margins and it does seem like the historically marginalized are at the very least reconsidering the two parties. So this broader dynamic is something we cannot lose sight of as we head into what promises to be a very different 
political context than that of the past year, four years. And so I'm pleased to be joined by our two guests who are gonna now do the majority of the talking <laughs> uh, to help us break down these election results and the crucial lessons they may offer regarding the role of American Muslims in the political fights that are sure to come. So I wanna start with Robert because your organization, CARE, provided one of the two data points that is sort of the impetus for today's conversation. Robert, can you help us set the stage for this conversation by delving a little bit into the, the polling that you guys did methodology, the purpose it was trying to serve, things like that. Absolutely. So again, Robert McCall with CARE. I was really excited to this year have the opportunity through community funding to do polling across the election. So we did a Super Tuesday poll. We did a poll right after the first presidential debate. And we also did a election night exit poll of Muslim voters. And I can kind of start with that exit poll. Uh, we targeted over 800, we had responses from over 800 uh, Muslim households. Those are households we identified that had very common Muslim names in a national database of 150,000 households that were randomly sampled. Uh, out of those responses, 84% uh, uh, reported that they had voted in that election. So then we narrowed in on them. Uh, and 69% said they voted for now president-elect uh, Joe Biden. 17% said that they had voted for Trump. Uh, President Trump, outgoing President Trump. And when then you look at it, there was 11% uh, that said they refused to answer. And we actually think that those might be shy Trump voters, not all of them, but a number of them. So the actual number of Muslims that voted for Trump could be somewhere upwards to 25%, at least, to, you know, CARES polling and guesstimation. Uh, and that's really telling. It shows that there is uh, a significant portion of the Muslim community that votes Republican. If you were talking about any community, that's actually very healthy to have a bifurcation of, you know, where voters align in the political spectrum to have representation. Uh, and when you look at prior years polling from CARE, uh, we actually saw in our 2016 election poll that Trump received, um, you know, like three or 4% more vocal support in this survey compared to the last one. So uh, somewhere near the margin of error, but we actually saw a slight increase in the number of Muslims that voted for Trump. And we have a number of reasons why we're guessing that happened. Uh, but, you know, I think we can get to that a little bit later in this um, interview. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. And so, yeah, I want you know to turn now to Yusuf. Now, Yusuf, you've had some time to digest these poll results or at least to check them against some of your, your really good research. Uh, so I wanna see if you can help us kind of put them into a, a, a context, more helpful context. So you know, my, my question to you and feel free to kind of, I know I've said a bunch that you probably have a comment on. Uh, can you help us understand how the different partisan political attitudes, which you, know, you track in your research, can help explain the support for the GOP or for Trump himself? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you uh, for, the, for the question and, and, and for this uh, much needed uh, panel, Adam. Um, so there are a few things, I guess, uh, going on uh, when you look at you know, who within the uh, American Muslim community um, is more likely to uh, uh, vote for Trump. Uh, and so one thing uh, that we can note is, you know, among uh, American Muslims, uh, around 20 to 25% uh, self-identify as non-Arab whites. Uh, and when you look at the political attitudes and behavior of this subgroup within uh, the American Muslim community, um, they're remarkably similar um, to self-identified uh, whites in the broader public. Uh, and so presumably um, they ended up uh, uh, continuing that trend and voting um, along the same lines as whites in the broader public. And from all the data that we've gathered so far, uh, around half of white Americans voted for Donald Trump. Uh, then the other thing, uh, you know, you need to kind of take into account when it comes to uh, uh, the American Muslim community um, is that they, they don't have a a natural political home, right? Um, you know, they might be certainly uh, uh, socially and, and fiscally liberal on some issues, but they'll also be socially and fiscally liberal 
uh, so uh, sorry, socially and fiscally conservative on other issues. Um, and when you look at uh, data from surveys uh, that are that are really quite robust in their methodology and that have a uh, large, um, you know, for for American Muslims, large proportion of American Muslims within their uh, data. Um, you know, this you see these you know uh, 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 intuitions really borne out. Uh, for example, the um, the CCES, the Cooperative Congressional Election Study, uh, uh, samples uh, tens of thousands of Americans and has a really large sample of American Muslims. Uh, and when you look at uh, uh, the data on American Muslims uh, in that survey, you see that around 60% of American Muslims uh, support uh, uh, allowing women to have the choice to uh, have an abortion, whereas 80% of all Democrats um, hold that position. Uh, similarly, on the more fiscal side, um, you know, 50% of American Muslims uh, support cutting corporate taxes, whereas only 25% of Democrats um, hold that position, right? So, so we're a, a very kind of heterodox community when it comes to um, you know, certain uh, uh, policy positions uh, within one uh, uh, of the two major parties. And then, of course, you know, um, uh, you have to look at, you know, this particular uh, uh, choice of candidates. Um, obviously, the reason that, you know, we all think that, you know, we were all kind of surprised by the numbers is because, you know, it, it's pretty natural to think that given the rhetoric of the past four years, the vast majority of Muslims would uh, vote to, um, you know, uh, get Donald Trump out of office. And, 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 this, and incidentally, that, that actually is the case. Um, you know, even if you take the high end of the estimate that voted for Trump, you're still talking, you know, two to one. Uh, that voted against him, right? So that's that's not that's not that's not a small margin. Um, but when you look at you know certain issue priorities that um, some members of the community may have, Donald Trump actually didn't do too bad a job on some things, right? I mean, it's it's not the case that he was just a complete failure in in in, in all domains and all facets. For example, if you look at, you know, if, if you are a quote unquote one issue voter and your one issue is say the Uyghur minority in China, uh, then Trump actually did pretty well uh, uh, on that, right? Um, so, you know, uh, it, it's not just, you know, the types of issues that animate you, but your rank order of those issues, your prioritization of those issues. So those are the three kind of main things that I would say we should kind of keep in mind when trying to wrap our heads around um, you know, what animated Muslims to, to cast a ballot for Donald Trump in the previous election. That's really good. Thank you, Yusuf. And, and Robert, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this point as well, because I know it, it's, it dovetails with, you know, like the, I'm sure maybe the purpose of the, the exit poll, right, is to see what are we looking at? How can we understand it for organizations like ours who are trying now to, uh, you know, uh, appeal to the interests of our constituencies? Well, you know, our, our exit poll was actually very laser focused just on how people voted. So we have done other surveys across the year. Uh, looking at our October survey, uh, we asked people just on perception of the Republican Party's disposition towards Muslims. And 24% thought actually the Republican Party was just neutral towards Muslims. And 16% thought the party was actually very friendly towards Muslims. Uh, when we did our Super Tuesday uh, survey back in March, uh, and we were polling Muslims on a number of, you know, public policy issues, which are kind of leaning towards, you know, more progressive type things, you know, 60 issues, 60s, 60% of Muslim voters uh, would support the U.S. government taking in more refugees, while 25% didn't want to take in any, and 14% reported being like unsure. 61% uh, of Muslim voters in our survey supported a single payer health care system uh, compared to the 27% that opposed it and 16, 11% that were unsure. 60% of Muslim voters uh, believed Islamophobia and anti-Muslim sentiment uh, had increased while 19% thought it decreased and 18% weren't sure. 69% supported uh, the idea that there was such a thing as environmental cli climate change and it's an emergency issue while 21% didn't believe it was an issue that was an emergency, 9% unsure. Uh, you know, just one, one last one, 73% of Muslim voters thought that there should be an increase in the federal minimum wage. 20% uh, disagreed 
uh, that there should be a raise. So when you look at these uh, issues over and over again, we find that there's this core 20, 25, 27% of Muslim voters that are actually opposed to what we would call progressive policy issues. And so, you know, that again, that's very in track that the same number of voters might just be voting for Trump in the election. Uh, or, you know, during our October uh, poll, we also asked about perceptions on issues of, you know, are you fiscally or uh, fiscally conservative or liberal? And 42% of Muslims said they were fiscally conservative. And when asked about policy issues, only 42% said they were progressive on you know, public policy issues uh, generally. It was up to self-interpretation. So you know, while 42% of Muslims might identify as being fiscally uh, conservative, 42%, same margin, different people, only identify as being progressive on issues. So I, I really do think that there's always an opportunity for the Republican Party or conservative-based uh, issued candidates to make a play for that 25% margin of the Muslim community and their votes. Um, and I, I think that's exactly what we saw in this election. And the last thing uh, I, I listened in on the uh, Muslims for Trump uh, Zoom call that ended up getting Zoom bombed by progressives, progressive Muslims. Uh, and a number of the Muslims there, uh, they were more concerned about economic issues. That was kind of a finer talking point of theirs that matches with prior care polling of Muslims that said they support the Republican Party or candidates like Trump when you dive in. Uh, they were less concerned about Islamophobia. They were less concerned about civil rights. Uh, they were more concerned about health care in the economy. And that kind of matched with that Zoom call. Uh, and you know, we, we think that also there was some misinformation where a number of Muslims uh, have you know, pointed to the president uh, winding drown, down the drone campaign overseas, uh, whereas really he shifted the countries they were targeting uh, and stopped doing reports. So there's just less information about that. Uh, and, um, you know, I think also during COVID, uh, speaking with people at the grassroots level, uh, when you got a check and it said the check for COVID was from Trump or you got PPE, uh, you know, the, uh, the emergency federal loans for employers, and it also has Trump's name on there. They thought Trump was doing this work directly when really that was a product of congressional and administrative negotiation. So, uh, again, Muslim voters, they're not a monolith. I really, uh, if we could dice down into how African-American Muslims vote, uh, they are slightly more progressive than Arabs or South Asians. Uh, and then it was an interesting point that was raised on Muslims that identify as um, white. I'm pretty sure they're not necessarily from the Caucasus or like half Swedish Irish like myself. Um, and so I think there, there's a lot of reasons why these Muslims are voting the way they do. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I want to follow up on that last point, because this also dovetails with something you said, Yusuf, about the, you know, if there's a sort of, you know, you could almost create a, a taxonomy of how, how people consider vote choices and what are the uh, factors or indicators of support, uh, you know, if you can kind of, you, you might order or order or hierarchicalize them. You know, Robert mentioned something. What about the role of our community's racial and socioeconomic diversity in the attitudes that may engender our partisan commitments? You know, how does, is, is it as simple as more, you know, a minority, community, Muslims from minority communities are more progressive. Can you help us understand this complexity a little bit? Sure. Um, so from, from, so I, I think, I think the distinction actually that, that Robert made uh, is a, a more nuanced and, and frankly, more correct distinction. Uh, so not so much from minority communities as in non-white, um, but from black or non-black communities. That's where we see um, uh, uh, a, a starker divide on, on certain preferences and, and certain behaviors. Um, but to the general point that, you know, I, 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 I think, I think, I think what, what, you know, the, you know, what, what you began, uh, this, this, this panel with, but note by noting that, you know, for all of us that have been paying any attention, Muslims are not a monolith. And, and, and if you, if you paid any attention to the data on American Muslims, prior to this election, 
you would know that Muslims are actually the most diverse religious community in the United States in terms of racial and ethnic identity. And so, you know, um, I, I don't mean to to kind of question the conceit of of this panel, right? But 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 you know, uh, uh, us being shocked, you know, uh, and 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 again, you know, and to a certain extent, rightfully so, but us being shocked that a not insignificant portion of the community would um, vote one way when you only have two choices, <laughs> right? Um, that belies this diversity. And, 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 and the thing that you know, I, I, I always kind of come back to, to really sharpen this point, if you think to yourself, who is the, the, the burning hot core of, of, of Trump supporters, right? Um, you know, uh, we're talking white evangelicals, right? And if you look at the data coming out of the 2020 elections, anywhere from one sixth to one fifth of white evangelicals didn't cast a ballot for Trump. And we're talking about a really homogenous community. So why would we think that you know us as a quite diverse community would have uh, far more of a uniform uh, 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 voting behavior, right? I mean, it just you know, uh, uh, and 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 so this gets to the kind of larger point that the forces that animate political behavior um, you know, within the American context more generally are at work among American Muslims. I mean, we are not context free, right? We are not living in a vacuum. We are living, we are embedded within the same society that you know, has these forces uh, uh, among them, you know, uh, 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 racial and, and ethnic experiences, right? That animate uh, uh, certain behaviors that make you more likely to do something or, or less likely to do something, but we're always speaking in kind of probabilistic terms. And you know, when we talk about identity, we should really, you know, uh, 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 do we would do well to 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 kind of pluralize that. It's identities, right? And the various identities that are at work at any given time are a function of the context that we're in, and which ones become more or less salient. Um, that is the work of the campaign. That is the work of your media consumption. That is the work of the community and how they, you know, choose to mobilize you. And so, you know, uh, 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 we shouldn't ever think that just by dint of having, you know, this one kind of obvious identity, um, you are going to act a certain way. Um, you're going to be cross pressured. Uh, right, based on your various identities, and then who wins at the end? That's going to be, you know, kind of a photo finish, right? And so that's that's how I always kind of think of it in terms of, you know, political behavior. And I think American Muslims are not immune um, to that, you know, uh, scenario that I just laid out. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And you, this is something that, you know, if I'm uh, remembering correctly, the an article that you wrote, which I I, re I recommend anyone to read. Uh, American Muslim political participation between diversity and cohesion. A point you make in that article is, along with co-authors Karam Dana and Matt Barreto, is like, you know, a lot of times, you know, there's even just different interpretations of Islam that are at work here in justifying a political or social sentiment or attitude. And then sometimes it works in the reverse, where a certain political sentiment or attitude uh, uh, impels a different interpretation of Islam, which then does real work in the world. Um, I, so, I think, yeah, go ahead, Robert. I think there was one hidden factor that we're not really discussing, which was really interesting that I found in CARES polling. And I've been doing this you know, pre-presidential election, midterm election survey since 2012. So I have some kind of trends to look back at. And just going back to 2012, 49% of Muslims said the Democratic Party was friendly. Uh, in 2016, 61% um, of Muslim voters thought the Democratic Party was friendly. And then in 2020, four years later, it drops down to 42% think the Democratic Party is friendly. And you know, we really scratched our heads on this. Why was there shift in perception of party friendliness? Why did it go from 61% friendly to 42? Why was there shift from only 37% thinking the party was neutral to 44? Uh, what, what happened there? And we really do believe that with the election of Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, to Congress and that fellow Democratic Party members targeting these elected officials because of their views on BDS, Israel, or other socially progressive issues, 
that these attacks actually damaged the Democratic Party's brand within some circles of the Muslim community. Uh, and it happened to the point where in 2012, 6% thought the party was unfriendly in one poll. 2016, it was two, and it jumps to 14% unfriendly in 2020. So I think that some of these you know, voters that either viewed the, the Republican Party as neutral or the Democratic Party is now being unfriendly towards Muslims, that there was this gain to be had by the Republican Party for some of those, you know, single issue voters or, you know, more along the middle undecided voters uh, where, you know, because of these attacks on Democratic lawmakers, uh, because of the absence of Muslims being publicly displayed at the Democratic National Conventions or, you know, um, you know, issues with some Biden campaign staff and progressive grassroots activists like Linda Sassor, uh, that these all had a factor to play in you know, Democratic Party mishandling of their relationship with the Muslim community. Mm. Yeah, and I, I, I think you know, I, this, this really gets into like what I think the next part of this conversation should be about, which is you know, this broader uh, processes of, of party realignment, or to, you know, if, if, if people agree that that's something that's occurring, then I think maybe that can help delimit this conversation too, because it does uh, influence the different way that the party sort of approaches issues that may be of interest uh, to an American Muslim voting constituency, which again, is very complicated in the ways that you both have done, taking great pains to, to, to point out. Um, and, you know, I, I won't go into what I take these processes to really be. I'll allow you guys to fill that picture in, uh, but just know that I have uh, a, a paragraph ready. <laughs> um, so how my, <laughs> how my broader processes of party realignment interact with uh, our community? You guys have given us a good picture of the diversity. So we have some, we know some fault lines uh, maybe, but yeah, you know, I'll, I'll start with, with Yusuf. Uh, if you, also, if you wanna, uh, fill in a picture because Robert mentioned something too about, you know, maybe this can help account for, for um, dissatisfaction with the party. I'm sure you can identify other things as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, that's an interesting uh, uh, a hypothesis. I think, you know, they're definitely worth, worth investigating. Um, my inclination is that we may be giving Muslims a bit too much credit in, 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 in that scenario, meaning that you really have to be like paying attention to make, you know, kind of those connections. Like, you know, here, is, here are, you know, the Muslims in Congress, and then here are, um, you know, the attacks that are coming against them, and here are the attacks that are coming from the Democrats, and so Democrats. And, and, and I'm not saying that's, that's not possible, but, I, I, you know, we're all very busy people, and yeah. this was even, you know, pre-COVID, and and so when it comes to politics, uh, a, a lot of folks are not like we are the outliers, right? <laughs> that really pay attention. A lot of folks, you know, they're it's kind of tangential. They get it through kind of osmosis, and that's why, you know, uh, as Robert was saying, a lot of things are kind of one on the margin. I think what the narrative that that probably did a lot more work, and that was a bit more consistent is this narrative of the Democrats and quote unquote identity politics, right? And the kind of very liberal policies um, that uh, uh, were being kind of mapped onto the Democratic Party. Um, and within certain American Muslim circles, um, you, know, you know, they were individuals and groups that were kind of balking uh, 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 when it came to, to those kinds of policies. So even with all the animosity that was coming from you know one side of the aisle um again they didn't quite feel at home on the other side of the aisle and you know when push came to shove you know again you only have two choices and so if you you you, you were thinking to yourself you know listen would my life be that much better right um you know voting for one party or the other, you might not have been able to kind of distinguish how much better or worse your life would be. But when you think to yourself, what does it say about me that I'm voting for one party or another? And that's really what, uh, what it comes down to quite more often um, than we, we would like to imagine. It's not the policies that kind of animate you. It's, it's what does it say about you to be a Democrat or to be 
a, a, a Republican, right? And if you are associating the Democrats with a lot of what you perceive to be um, these socially detrimental policies, well, then, you know, that might be enough to kind of move you to, to the other side of the aisle. And so is there a kind, are we seeing the beginnings of a more kind of secular, and, and, and I should say, I'm not using secular in kind of the religious sense, but secular in the kind of neutral uh, sense of the word, you know, gradual sense, right? Secular meaning gradual. Are we seeing the beginning of a gradual shift, right? Back to um, pre-2000 era, uh, American Muslim political behavior, where we saw, you know, a lot more parity in terms of the two party system. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I still I think that American Muslims are such a nascent community. We're really just beginning to cohere around something that we might call a political consciousness, um, that everything is very much still kind of in flux, very much still malleable. And so I think we're going to see a lot of, you know, kind of uh, 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 the pendulum swinging uh, uh, back and forth a bit before it kind of settles on some equilibrium down the road. Yeah, go ahead, Robert, if you have something to add. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, you know, pre-2000, the community was, you know, not perfectly, but evenly divided, so to speak, between voting Democrat and Republican. I think among African-Americans, it favored even more so before the rest of the community favoring uh, the Democratic Party. Um, I, I think that the, the community is always in shift. I, I think there was a realignment that kind of settled by 2008 to 12, uh, when you had a, a heightening of Republican rhetoric uh, against the Muslim community. I, I don't think I fully have seen a softening of that under Trump. It's going to be very interesting to me, just like there was an autopsy report that the Republican Party did when they lost to Obama. Uh, and they said, we should reprioritize our outreach to minority Asian, they didn't say Arab or Muslim, but they said Asian as a catch-all, communities. I'd be, be very interested in what a uh, an auto Republican autopsy report of this election looks like, and if they are going to start trying once again, uh, a la Michael Steele, uh, repositioning themselves uh, with minorities in the U.S., if that's where they're going to go or if they think that they kind of have a strategic stronghold in rural white areas and they're gonna play that card for another 20 years. I, I think that is gonna have a bigger impact on how Muslims vote for the Republican party than you know, any shifts inside the Muslim community itself. Um, I, I do believe that there is always going to be a core of about 25, 30% of Muslims that will continue to vote Republican because if they did it in this election, these are pretty steadfast Republican voting Muslims. I really don't see a shift. Uh, without dropping any names, when you speak with national Muslim leadership and you kind of get to know them in some organizations, there are a lot of, it's kind of the reverse, the reverse of the trend I said earlier. There are a lot of socially conservative Muslims that are fiscally progressive. Um, and they're willing, I think some Muslims, not necessarily the grass tops, but at the bottom, they're willing to sacrifice uh, economic policy for you know, issues on traditional family structure or you know, issues of social conservatism that they might feel excluded or not being the quote unquote, the right fit for the Democratic Party. Uh, as you know, there are, there are litmus tests in running for office in either party. Um, so it, it, it's interesting to me. Um, I think I was really excited that I saw 170 Muslims run for office. I saw 60 Muslims get elected to office. The majority of those candidates ran on a Democratic Party ticket. Um, there were only a handful of Republicans. It would be very interesting to see if more Muslim Republicans run in the future. But I, and I think this begs a, a, a question that you know Yusuf helped answer a, a little bit ago. Uh, but more is going to have to be done on, uh, you know, thinking about it. But the question, right, is, you know, uh, how much of the choice is uh, given by, you know, instead of a question about if my vote is going to get me something, it's who do I want to be in the choice? Because the reason that, that you know, that it ends up being that, that way, the choices end up made that way, right, is because a lot of the, for the socially conservative, but maybe fiscally progressive Muslims, they know that, 
uh, large scale economic change is not in the cards, at least right now, at least not with the next vote. So instead it turns into this, how do my uh, political or social attitudes comport with an interpretation of Islam? You know, I'm, I, you know, and then maybe that dovetails into the social conservative, uh, uh, you know, ref frame of reference, and then the end of voting Republican for that reason. If I yeah. can, if I can just say something, that's a, that's a, that's a really astute insight. And I think that um, were we to get, you know, uh, uh, you know, very robust, you know, kind of rich data on American Muslims, we can kind of tease out whether these, you know, Trump uh, uh, voting Muslims were kind of doing so because they actually didn't, they were low in, in political efficacy. Like they didn't think their vote, quote unquote, mattered. And so, as you were saying, they wanted to kind of feel more secure in, in themselves and, you know, kind of, you know, vote what uh, they thought was, you know, they were, they were trying to guard against the downside as opposed to kind of, you know, uh, go for uh, uh, the upside, right? I mean, so, so I think, I think there, there, there are a lot of dynamics here um, that, that are going to be, unfortunately, really difficult to unearth just because, you know, the lack of, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 you know the, the, this, this kind of, you know, broad-based data that we have on groups such as, you know, Latinos and, 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 and African-Americans, right? Um, you know, uh, where we kind of reach that point, you know, hopefully we can, we can kind of tease that out. But, um, you know, that may be something that's, that's more available kind of down the road. Yeah. And then that, that also does dovetail with this other thing, which is uh, party or political de-alignment, right? So a lot of the, the just the, the way that this the voter choice gets individualized is because, you know, both parties almost uh, encourage an individualization of voting at all or in the, in the first place. So people end up making, and, and then it's up to, you know, who knows? And it's tough to, to gather data that's going to tell you a clear story when people are uh, voter choices so individualized. I want to um, uh, now turn to this kind of prescriptive or strategic uh, responses or, or uh, topic before we close. Uh, so, you know, yeah, maybe it's unclear for us uh, what to make of this uh, at, the, at, a, at the ground floor level. Like, what does this really say about the American Muslim community? You know, if anything, you know, the first part of the, the webinar will answer that we're complex uh, but how do you expect how do you guys expect the political establishment such as it is if we can call it that you know <laughs> to just to give it one term to respond to this to this development or you know to the fact that maybe in more so than in years past the american muslim vote is up for grabs more you know. I, I i think it's that last part that you said the muslim vote is up for grabs i really do think that while there are these kind of camps of strong Muslim voters for either party, I, I really do think better plays at the Muslim community, direct messaging, direct engagement is going to be able to shift how Muslims who already vote are voting, but also future Muslim voting generations. Um, I was really impressed that the Biden campaign had a, a Muslim outreach personnel uh, and that, you know, Biden several times spoke directly at Muslim community events um, and that other Democratic candidates like Biden um, uh, and I think it was Castro maybe, uh, they also engaged other Muslim events throughout the, um, the primary process. Uh, Trump actually on his campaign website had a Muslims for Trump um, link and they had several events. They, you know, they weren't the most populous events online, but they were organizing. And it seemed that somewhere in the workings of the Republican Party, they understood that there is this core constituent of Muslim voters and that in an election that just came down to several thousand voters uh, in some states, you need that 25% of the Muslim community to come out and support your candidate. So I, I really do think when we talk about community alignment, it's definitely in the hands of parties and how they're going to better pursue our community, candidates coming to Muslims, uh, listening to our concerns, and especially when there are differences of opinions when it comes to Israel, BDS, how Muslims are treated in India, making sure not to rebuff Muslims, to deject them, to push their concerns aside. It's okay sometimes to have differences of opinions, but not to castigate your opponents on those issues, right? And so I think there needs to be more nuance within the parties 
and how they treat Muslim voters. Uh, one thing I found really interesting was in the Super Tuesday poll care did, uh, we found that 76% um, uh, of uh, Muslim voters age 18 to 34 supported Bernie, while only 16% supported Joe Biden. Um, and, you know, in the overall 58% supported Bernie versus the 26. And I think that's because earlier on Sanders uh, had a better game of Muslim community engagement that he built up from the prior election. Uh, and, you know, I think once it was clear Biden was the nomination, there was the, the transfer over to him. But, you know, he had to work for that and he had to do real engagement. And that was part of his political plan to get the Muslims on board. He had to engage Muslim voters. So I think just looking forward in these elections, uh, parties are going to uh, be aware that Muslims need to be won over, uh, and that's going to be part of their campaign strategies. And Yusuf, if you have something you'd like to add on this point as well. Um, so, you know, I'll, 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 I'll actually uh, leave the, the strategizing to the experts, you know, uh, at, yeah, at MPAC yeah. and, and Ending Care. I mean, I can say maybe just a couple of real quick takeaways, um, you know, you know, that that you can kind of pull out of uh, the literature on, on, on political engagement. And that is that, you know, the more you vote, um, the more voting becomes habitual and the more voting becomes habitual, the more you start being thought of as a voting community. And that in and of itself garners a lot more attention. And I think that that you know, based on, you know, really all the numbers that we have seen uh, from this previous election, um, you know, it's, it's uh, the American Muslims really came out in, 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 in historic numbers. And so that is only going to kind of bode well, I think, um, mm -hmm. for more representation and more uh, recognition uh, of that community uh, going forward. Um, and, you know, to a point that Robert made actually really early on in our conversation, um, we shouldn't, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it might be a bit of a head scratcher, you know, that, that, you know, perhaps, you know, upwards of 35% of American Muslims voted for, for Donald Trump, but we shouldn't see this as kind of, you know, an unalloyed bad, quote unquote, right? Um, because, you know, it does signal that, you, you know, yeah, this, we're, we're not a captured community, right? Like you actually have to do a little work, you know, to kind of, uh, 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 get us uh, in your corner. And I think that that um, will uh, uh, hopefully push, uh, um, you know, certain uh, strategists within uh, both parties. Uh, now that they see that, you know, th there, there may be some swinginess, right, within, within uh, our constituency. Um, you know, I, I always kind of balked at that term before, just because, you know, we have, we have voted uh, uh, so uh, uh, overwhelmingly for the Democratic Party for so many cycles. Um, but now that, you know, there is, there is something of a question mark there, um, it may actually force both parties to, to do a little bit more work, particularly now that Michigan um, is becoming somewhat of a perennial battleground state. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I wonder if you'd have the, you know, you mentioned something in your appearance on the Mad Mem Luke's podcast. Right. And I thought it was the exact right way of looking at the issue, which is uh, this opens up a, a space for organizations like ours to th uh, and other community organizations to think about new possibilities for coalition building with other social and political groups, especially given the possibility that, you know, or what has been revealed to us that many of our the attitudes, sentiments, which drive something as important as voter choice. Uh, right, may also align with those of groups that we didn't even think about having uh, alignment with. Uh, you might have the same answer, you know, I'll leave that to the strategist, but if you have any other thoughts on that, uh, you know, especially because that, that's where your research uh, uh, focuses on as well, right, is uh, align, you know, th those attitudes and sentiments. Do you see any uh, uh, different uh, possibilities in that, in that arena? Well, I, I think that, you know, um, what, what, what we, we shouldn't, you know, in, in the American Muslim community uh, make the same kind of assumptions that those in the broader society seem to have made about the American Muslim community, which is just assume that we have natural yeah. uh, um, uh, affinities and disaffinities, right? You know, so, um, you know, so, so, so we need to do a bit more research and, and that's, that's starting to kind of, you know, come to the fore. 
Um, you know, I want to just, you know, shout out the work that uh, ISPU has been doing uh, on this front. Um, and, but so, yeah, so, so who we build coalitions with, that's going to be really important because at the end of the day, we don't like to kind of, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the, it's, it's, it's the uh, paradoxically big elephant in the room, but pointing to the fact that we are a small community, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and so we don't, we don't want to kind of, you know, shine a light on that, but, but, it, but that is the case. And so how do we multiply our efficacy? when we have these allies, right, that are that come to bat for us and think of us as part of their kind of coalition, um, that allows us to kind of, uh, 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 you know, as, as something of a force multiplier, right, when it comes to the political arena. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we need to kind of, you know, really uh, uh, be uh, uh, more mindful of, of how to build more efficacious um, kind of coalitions, I think, uh, moving forward. Uh, and 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 make sure that those coalitions are representative of what the actual community wants. Because what we don't want to do is have the coalitions at the kind of you know uh, um, elite level uh, be disconnected from the mass level, um, because that might actually uh, uh, demobilize um, uh, many segments of our community if that turns out to be the case. And so we really have to be mindful of that. Yeah. yeah. I think those are great points, Robert. Uh, I, I wanted to give you guys a chance to offer any final comments as we close. Uh, maybe that's where you were going, Robert. Uh, and then also anything you'd like to plug uh, or ways that your our viewers can engage uh, you or your organization's work. Definitely, I'll just add one comment on coalition building. Uh, I think that, and this is a growing sector in the Muslim community, it's Muslims elected to office. Again, I, I mentioned 170 Muslims ran for office, more than 61 office. Uh, to win an office and to continue winning offices, that means you're building very diverse coalitions and you are listening to the concerns of not only just Muslims that might be getting into office, but all the other communities that you have to engage with to win an office. And I can't tell you how many times I've engaged with Muslim members in Congress or at the state legislature who are working in broad coalitions and they're asking care, are you supporting X or Y bill, which is tangential to my minority communities or general welfare issues, but um, that is something that, you know, the Muslim community is going to engage with even more as we continue to elect more officials into office, you're going to see uh, a more generalization of the issues, priorities, and concerns that Muslim leaders are expressing, uh, where it, it goes out from just Muslim community concerns to allied minority community concerns to general large welfare issue concerns. Uh, and I, I think that's also how we always build more support for the Muslim community in general, uh, whether it's through established political parties or other nonprofit networks. I, I just you know, promoted three letters internally. I care coalition letters we should sign on today. I'm sure at least I'm gonna see MPAC on one of those. Uh, and so we're already kind of doing this at the grass tops. It is important at the local levels that uh, you know, we remain diverse in our issues and policies that we're tracking as a community. Uh, I think local officials getting elected to office are going to be a part of helping in that. Uh, the one thing I would plug is actually CARES election report that we did with uh, Jetpack and Empower. It's on our website at care.com, C-A-I-R.com. Uh, it's one of the main banners on the top of the website right now. If you're interested in how Muslims are running for office, who, what issues they're supporting, where they're getting elected. Uh, I, I think that's a real big part of this election, a whole nother conversation we can have on the diversity of the Muslim candidates that are being elected to office. Uh, and I, I think that's really promising uh, in these discussions that it's just not Muslims turning out for candidates from other communities, but we're turning out for candidates within our own community. And that's how we'll build political power as well. Great, thank you, Robert, and uh, and and Yusuf, if you have the, uh, I'll give you the final word before we close. Honestly, uh, you know, I think I think Robert covered, um, you know, really uh, uh, everything, and 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 you too, Adam. Um, you know, thank you so much for uh, your expert uh, moderation of this discussion. Uh, let me just plug uh, 
research institutions and researchers that are actually doing the work to try to better understand Thanks. American Muslims. Be sure to support them as uh, alongside your support of the impacts and the cares of the world. Uh, you know, make sure that you uh, set aside some of your donations um, for those institutions and scholars that are actually trying to gain better insight into the American Muslim community as well. I get some of my best data from ISPU. I'm always excited about their reports. Yeah, I appreciate both of you guys and, and the organizations that you guys shouted out are a part of. Uh, thank you guys for for taking the, this hour uh, to help us take another step forward in the ends of or in achievement of the ends of our community. I uh, really appreciate it. Looking forward to the next time we get a chance to talk. Uh, and and thank you to the people, those who joined us and are watching uh, from home. So we'll, we'll see you. you guys again soon. Inshallah. Bye. Uh, it was a pleasure. Bye.